Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to the Renovatio podcast. Uh, my name is Jan Erdali. Today I'm going to be speaking with um, Asmauddin, a little bit about our guest. Asmauddin is a religious liberty lawyer and scholar working for the protection of religious expression for people of all faiths in the U.S. and abroad. Her, her areas of expertise include law, law and religion, uh, international human rights law, uh, Islam, and religious freedom. Uh, she's the author of two books, uh, one recently published. Her first book was entitled, let me just get this up, the, the, uh, When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. And her more recent book is called The Politics of Vulnerability, How to Heal Muslim-Christian Relations in a Post-Christian America. Um, I've been looking forward to speaking with uh, Asma for a while. I think she has a rare um, combination of um, subject area concerns and also a kind of, uh, I should say, real expertise in the fine-grained detail um, of the law relating to these areas, which I think is not that common, and I think it makes her a great resource for not just the Muslim community, but for um, multiple communities in the United States and actually probably beyond the United States. So uh, welcome, Asma. It's very nice to be speaking with you. Thank you, Jonner. I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of topics here that I would, I would love to cover. I, w I want to uh, try to restrict them, and, I, and I'm hoping that we can somehow um, explore some of these important you know, cultural, social, um, even political issues um, relating to religious freedom, um, to the rights of Muslims, but also to be able to inform that discussion with your um, knowledge and your expertise on the, you know, on the mechanics of the law. You know, you want to say when the rubber hits the road, because it's easy to have a discussion that's kind of, you know, you know, emotive and sentimental, and you know, to 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 talk about feelings and kind of the present moment. But it's quite another to actually be able to have a view of, um, you know what can practically be accomplished, what the real possibilities are, you know, what happens in the courts, what the law allows, and so forth and so on. So these are things which I hope that we can kind of get to and really, you know, have a theoretically informed discussion. But uh, and perhaps in the beginning, just very briefly, and I know you've probably been asked these questions a million times, and forgive me for asking it, but perhaps you could, in a brief fashion, just maybe sum up the the subject matter areas of your two books, you know, what your first book was about and maybe how it led to the second book. And then we can, on the basis of that, maybe continue speaking about some of the details. Sure. So both of the books come out of my now over a decade of experience in the religious liberty space, uh, the majority of which were spent actually litigating these cases. And then more recently, I've kind of moved into the space of scholarship and public engagement around religious liberty, entirely sort of inspired by the fact that it's so such a hot button issue with so much misunderstanding and yet it's so critical to everything that Americans are going through right now that I really felt like somebody needed to kind of bridge that space between the legalese that a few people understand and the public understanding of that. So you know back in 2009 I started um, at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty which is a nonprofit religious liberty law firm that is currently on a pretty significant uh, winning streak at the U.S. Supreme Court, actually has a complete win record with all of its cases at the Supreme Court, a number of which I got to work on when I was there. And um, both have experience working on international legal issues, primarily in Muslim majority states, and then a lot of it on domestic issues. And I noticed about like towards the, the latter half of my tenure there, I was involved with this case called, it was a Hobby Lobby case, which involved this for-profit you know, nationwide crafts chain uh, that brought a challenge against the contraceptive mandate portion of the Affordable Care Act. And there was this concern that the fundamentalist Protestant owners of Hobby Lobby said that they were, they were fine providing the long list of contraception that was required, except the two that they considered to be afford patients. So this would be the morning after and the week after pill. And they said that this just, you know, according to our beliefs against abortion, we also cannot facilitate 
abortion or the use of these abortifacients by others, including our employees, they're free to use them, but we cannot be sort of this facilitator, we cannot be complicit in what we think is an evil action. And so this was an extremely high profile case. It was the one I think that got the most attention, even though there was a wide range of Catholic nonprofits that also brought challenges. And it was kind of, it thrust me by virtue of being at the Beckett Fund and working on this case, it thrust me into the space where suddenly religious liberty, which previous to that, I think my experience was mostly on pretty sort of bread and butter issues related to um, building places of, of worship, wearing religious garb, types of things that most people didn't really fight about. And suddenly I was sort of thrust into this, this political space where religious freedom was essentially being understood through a very political lens. And, but I was consistent. I mean, I saw, but you, when you work on these issues, I mean, you, you mentioned, John, earlier, the sort of this being, having this expertise in the law and the way that it connects the, it helps us move past the emotive to the actual practical implications. And that for me has always been the function of law. Like what is actually at issue in these cases? What are the parties asking for? And what is the court actually deciding as opposed to what the media likes to say it's deciding, which, it's, which is much easier for purposes of sound bites than the more complex arguments. And so I saw this huge disjuncture between what was going on in the public portrayal of the case and what was actually happening. And so I put myself really out there as this person who uh, belonged to a religious minority and there was this and was willing to counter this narrative that these white Christians that were part of this case are somehow against women, they're against uh, and then beyond that it's kind of grown into against minorities of all sorts. And so to be a female and to be a religious minority and a racial minority and to say, wait a second, I think something different's going on uh, was was pretty significant. But concurrent to that, you know, as I saw this increased tendency among white Christians to kind of bring these religious liberty claims and to, you know, to have this feeling of, of threat that their religious liberty is being attacked in this country. And for me to put myself out there, I took it also as an opportunity to show up to these spaces and tell these same white Christians, look, I'm here for you. And I fully expect that you will be there for my religious community when it's going through its struggles. And there was a disjuncture there. Like I have very sort of vivid memories and experiences of just, you know, for example, being at this thing called the Religious Freedom Rally, which was a rally. And it was rowdy, as all rallies are. And I stepped up to the mic and I made that very clear statement that I am here and I'm standing for you. But I fully expect that you stand in support of my community. And suddenly there was total silence and wow. the rally was no longer rowdy at all. And so wow. that was where the first book came out of. It really came out of a general sort of unease uh, with what I saw as, as essentially hypocrisy. And again, the first book, which was published in 2019, and I wrote it in 2018, happened in the midst of the Trump era when very sort of explicit attacks were being made on the religious freedom of Muslims. And it was happening at a time when the Republican Party was all about religious freedom. Like that was their top priority. That is what Trump sold himself on to 81% of white evangelicals and said, I will protect your religious freedom. And then he proceeded mm -hmm. to do exactly that. And yet there was, again, that hypocrisy that was becoming very, very, uh, like very obvious at this point. And specifically so that there was a claim that was gaining prominence that Islam is not a religion and that therefore Muslims don't get religious freedom. And so that's where the first book came out of, which is titled, again, When Islam is Not a Religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm explaining in that book, hey, guys, for those of you who really value religious freedom, this is the worst idea. Don't make this, make, don't make this argument, because once you start carving out exceptions to the law, guess who those exceptions are going to come back and be applied to, uh, yeah. in addition to all the other religious groups. Right. And so I went on tour with this book. Um, it was an incredibly fruitful, busy tour. Uh, that was only brought to an end because of the COVID shutdown. And throughout that time period, I noticed a time and again that there was this sort of willingness among many conservative audiences to listen to what I had to say, even though I was being very explicitly uh, critical of their actions or their co-religionist. And that phenomenon, the sort of social psychological phenomenon of what was going on uh, is what I parsed in the second book, which is called mm -hmm. The Politics of Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, that's very interesting because it, it leads to the general theme of what I was interesting, interested in, which is, well, let me ask it this way. Uh, in what ways, and I'm thinking of the American Muslim community now, although that's not the only relevant community, but in what ways do you think 
the American Muslim community as they're looking out at these social legal issues related to religious freedom and rights and so forth. Is there a confusion? In other words, is there a way in which the, the issues that they're, they're, that they're most worried about and that they're thinking about don't really match up with the issues that maybe you think they should be caring about? In other words, are we, are we, are, are we not being, are the Muslims of America not being strategic and tactical in the right ways and thinking about the issues and thinking about issues that are important but maybe not getting that they're not being productive and constructive in the way that they approach those issues, specifically about the law, specifically about how you, let's say, carry out um, rights campaigns and kind of activism and so forth and so on. Is there, a, is there a mismatch there that could be corrected and what might be some ways of correcting it? My, so the short answer is yes. I think there is a mismatch, uh, at least among a, a significant uh, portion of the community. And that's from my perspective, again, coming at this from a legal, uh, from both a legal perspective and also someone coming at this from the perspective of wanting to protect the community and its interest in the long term. And so just as there's lots of confusion around religious freedom and how it works and how it needs to be consistent for everyone in order for it to be available to anyone, uh, there's lots of confusion about that on the part of Christians and the, those on the political right. But similarly, there's a lot of confusion around that on the left. And that was something, and, and including many Muslims. Um, I think that, that was the, that's the central sort of confusion that I set out in the first book to explain. And then, well, there's the, the majority of the book is uh, geared toward conservatives and Christians. Toward the end, toward the last half of the book, I turned to this other aspect of this phenomenon of when Islam is not a religion, which I know, John, you've also tackled in your writing. And in that part, I sort of turned my attention and my criticism to the political left and talk about the ways in which Islam, even as it's, as it's being championed, is being championed as something other than a religion and other than something that should be understood in terms of its deep sort of spiritual significance and the sense of duty that comes with being a religious believer. And it's being defended on very particular terms, the terms to, with, that are consonant between a particular political agenda and it is defended to that extent, as opposed to uh, when Islamic beliefs and practices might start to line up with conservative, the types of conservative beliefs that Christians, for example, might have, then that support begins to fall through. And so I bring attention to that, and it is something that I explore more completely in my second book. It was like the last chapter of my first book, I kind of threw this out there, and folks are like, you kind of need to like delve a little bit deeper into that, and I felt the need to do that as well. And so in the second book, I explore that using an, a number of different tools, uh, both so, social psychology, I use law and politics again, but also political science and, and this idea of mega identities, which we can get into uh, soon. And the concern at, at the core of it, as you referenced, is that if you, if you think of us as one of a range of marginalized minorities that are being positioned against this powerful white Christian majority, and that's the frame that you're going to put on this, then you're going to begin to overlook ex exactly all the different things that you're giving up. Yes. Yeah, so what are those things? In other words, if, if, if we can maybe now get into that a little bit, like get into the, some of the details of it, like, um, you know, one angle of it is, you know, it's, there have been some suggestions, and here's where I'm really out of my depth, and this is why I, I would love to hear what you have to say about it. You know, there's a kind of you know, Muslims might have a vague idea that the Constitution affords them certain kinds of rights, and there's certain kinds of remedies that you have in terms of the law if your, right, if your rights are violated. And, you know, typically we speak or we think about it in terms of free exercise, you know, establishment clause, you know, that, the, that, that we have certain religious protections. But then there's a movement or a set of ideas, you know, people have written articles trying to suggest that perhaps a better approach is the one that relies not so much on the First Amendment, but on the Fourteenth Amendment. And, and, and seeking remedies under equal protection as opposed to religious freedom. And it seems to me as a, as a layman in this area that what happens with that is that you begin to, um, as it were, uh, um, uh, sort of put, your, put yourself in a certain camp, right? Because it, it would seem, and pr correct me if I'm wrong, that in America at least, the First Amendment religious freedom has, has taken on this uh, aura of being a, a conservative issue, right? A kind of a right-wing issue. Whereas, you know, this idea of equal protection, protection of minorities, 
uh, and that seems to, seems to be associated with being a left-wing issue. And therefore, pursuing religious freedom, if a Muslim pursues religious freedom, uh, fights for religious freedom, this is seen as being, by some on the left, as uh, quote-unquote aligning with conservative forces, which, is, which would be considered a no-no for them. But then pursuing uh, equal protection under the 14th Amendment and taking that path, while it might seem to afford certain kinds of advantages, number one, runs the risk of undermining the freedoms that you would get under the First Amendment. And number two, it might also seem to uh, uh, make the community to be aligned with certain left-wing causes, let's say, or sort of left-wing communities or activist uh, sort of trends. And I was wondering if, you know, that very kind of crude way of asking the question, I mean, is there something to that? In other words, does, is there an issue where Muslims need to be paying attention to um, these different approaches, these different alignments that potentially arise? I've heard you say before that, you know, especially in the American case, uh, the protections afforded by the First Amendment in the United States are quite broad and quite powerful. And these are something very precious and very, we have to be very careful about giving them up or trying to sort of replace them with some other sets of protections. And I was wondering, and I, I kind of want to invite you to be as, you know, maybe even get a technical and kind of get into it. Like, you know, what should we be thinking about in this area? Like, at, what are the issues? Sure. So there's a lot that you bring up here, uh, even beyond the technicalities, which I will get to. Uh, but you know, you're talking about being careful about approaches and alignments. This is something that I explain in my most recent book using this concept of mech identities, which I just referenced a little bit earlier in this interview. And I thought it was, you know, I, I had this particular idea. I had my observations. I like to say I was sort of in the field having uh, these various interactions with people, kind of reading up on literature, watching what's going on in the news, on, on social media. And there was this phenomenon that I think a number of us have identified, this sort of alignment of Muslims as part of the liberal camp. And what, But I didn't quite have the terms to describe exactly what was going on in a way that was easily explainable until I stumbled upon some political science research in which the term or the concept of mega identities uh, was introduced. And, and essentially the idea is that our political identities have ceased to be simply about policy issues or differences on policy positions, but have now extended to include a wide range of what they call traits, uh, or traits of the, either the conservative mega identity or the liberal mega identity. And this includes things even like where we do our grocery shopping. If you shop at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods, you're probably a liberal. If you drive a hybrid or electric car, then you're probably a liberal. And there's actual studies showing that if you eat sushi, for example, you're probably a liberal. And so there, these things have become so sorted in the public imagination, but also through data, there, there is actual evidence that these things do sort themselves according to your political identity. And what I realized, I mean, that gave me the term or the frame to begin to understand what was going on with American Muslims in the US, such a championing of Muslims and Muslims' rights, I, I understood as becoming traits of the liberal mega identity. And there's plenty of data, plenty of things you can just observe. I think all of us have experienced it to some extent, whether you agree with that alignment or you don't agree with that alignment, the fact is that that alignment has many, in many cases has happened. And I think a perfect example of that, for example, was the Women's March soon after Trump's inauguration, in which one of the most prominent symbols of anti-Trumpism was a poster with a woman, a Muslim with a headscarf. Uh, also, one of the four uh, organizers of the Women's March was a Muslim woman in a headscarf. And there's other data, such as, for example, right after um, various terrorist attacks, and people who are polling uh, attitudes toward Muslims noticed that over a certain period of time, even after a terrorist attack, there's an increase in positive attitudes towards Muslims. But that increase actually happens among Democrats. And so when you see the commentators who or the 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 ones who have conducted these studies sort of analyze them and sort of try to figure out what's going on. They say this isn't really just this isn't really about Muslims. What's happening here is that Muslims have become a symbol of anti-Trumpism. And so if that is what you're aligned against, then your your attitudes are going to become positive and stay positive. And so that, among many other studies that I cite in the book where this phenomenon is happening, 
And so the flip side of that, of course, is that when the mega identities and all the traits are lined up against each other so that you have to oppose all the traits of the opposing political tribe means that a lot of conservatives then are moved to resist Muslims and to resist Muslims' rights uh, as, as a function of their opposition to the liberal mega identity. And I'm not saying this is the entire explanation. I, I recognize that Christian hostility toward Muslims is, is a complicated matter. American hostility or anyone's hostility towards Muslims is has all kinds of elements of, of as you know, John, or there's there's something to it when people say there's a racialization happening and racism. There, we def, there's definitely concerns about securitization. But until I did my study, I didn't really see people digging deep into this element of political tribalism. And so the way this is lined up is that, oh, yes, Muslims are traits of the liberal mega identity, but they come alongside a number of others, marginalized minorities. Essentially, the framing here is powerful white Christians versus XYZ list of marginalized minorities. And Muslims make the list, but so do Black Lives Matters uh, activists, so do uh, sexual minorities, and, and then so on. Um, so that you can put the Me Too movement, if you see the way the conservatives respond to a number of different surveys and so on, there's a positioning against, it kind of goes like this, it's like BLM, uh, feminist, you know, LGBTQ individuals and Muslims, and we're kind of just put into a group and we're one of many. And that certainly is the way that these things are thought about on the left in terms of the, the protection of Muslims' rights, which I do want to take a moment to say that that work that is being done among many liberals, and I know people who are left of center, who are liberals, who are doing tremendous work, and, and none of this is to, is to uh, show like lack of gratitude for the work that they've done. Sure, um, I think it's really just kind of show, trying to dig into some of the complexities and seeing how how true that is to sort of maintaining the authenticity of, of the Muslim experience. Um, but so you see this list, and, and the way that, that it does function is that you are one among many on this list, and you have to work, if you're, if you're, if you're ex pretty much expecting kind of quid pro quo, if you're expecting support from other members of this list, then you've got to support their rights. And I, I, I think that it's, it's an interesting concept. Um, it's something that I briefly critique in my first book towards the end. Um, I... I mean, it's actually a very common argument. And I, I remember there was this article by two very high profile Muslims that was circulated where it was, they basically said, look, civil rights is not a buffet. You can't pick and choose. You got you to protect it for everyone. But what I find interesting about that framing is the fact that somehow civil rights is only a, something that belongs to this list of marginalized minorities. And rights are not something that belong to people who are conservative or who are thought to be part of the majority. And I'm, as I'm sure you know, John, there's this discourse now about power. It's all about power and our civil rights right. are ultimately there to, to help those who don't have power. And if you do have power, suddenly you cease to be human, or at least for the purposes of your human and civil rights, which I find to be... Um, a, a, a problematic concept for a number of reasons. One, I think by virtue of being human, you should have human rights, right? I'm somebody, again, who did a lot of advocacy in Muslim majority states, and I've seen that way too often in terms of what happens when you begin to take a selective approach to human rights. Um, but I mean, the other part of it is that there's really a question of like, who is a minority? How are we defining privilege? How are we defining harm? And that's something I explore in the second book. I'm like, you're just taking it for granted that your definition of harm is a definition of harm. Whereas if you talk to folks on the right, they all absolutely feel like a persecuted minority. And oftentimes the media kind of laughs at that. They scoff at it. Ah, the evangelical persecution complex, like just a bunch of you know white people who had a lot of power and now they don't have power and they're upset about it. But they're, they're real emotions. They're the real feelings of being under siege, of being harmed by the quote unquote liberal elite. Um, and I don't think all of it is made up. I don't think all of it is far-fetched. I think a lot of it is, is real. Um, and so I think that when you get into this question of privilege, oppression, harm, and so on, I think you have to understand that there are different perceptions of harm and even different perceptions of minorities. Um, and in reality, demographically, white Protestants are actually now a numerical mo minority in this country and are continuously being projected to be outnumbered by both religious and racial groups. Uh, in the near future. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one part of the, the sort of response to your point about alignments and approaches and, and mm -hmm. 
um, parts of the argument that people are not seeing. Now, in terms of the difference between being pr protecting our rights under the Free Exercise Clause and the Equal Protection, I think you and I might have read the same article. There, there was one, there was a Law Review article that I actually cited in my first book, um, and I was also similarly shocked when, when I read that argument being proposed that instead of free exercise, you should be using, uh, the, you know, you should, you should be using equal protection. And I was like, you're just leaving way too much on the table if you do that. I mean, in addition to all these sort of political and intricate social th issues that I just brought up in terms of defining your rights in relation to the rights of other people on this list of minorities, there's also the question, I mean, which became very clear to me doing litigation in this space was just how vast the protections are under the, uh, the Free Exercise Clause, but more specifically, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the deft way that groups that understand what all is possible, bring legal claims and make really sophisticated legal arguments in court and get tremendous protection. And whether it be you know, a wide range of questions around autonomy, such as institutional autonomy, I think the Muslim community as a, group, as a, as a, a community that's growing and, and is not in a place yet where we have a lot of institutions, doesn't fully understand what's at stake. And I fear that well, one day we'll get to this place where you know, we're increasingly becoming more sophisticated, and then we're going to realize just exactly how much we left on the table if we mm. don't help sort of protect the rights to religious autonomy that Christian organizations are fighting for. Right, right. And, and even more broadly, I mean, there's, I, I can go through a list of different things that are protected under free exercise, but I think in this day and age, religious freedom is the way to protect the ability just to dissent to stand apart from the status quo and say that I have the right to express this view, whether the majority accepts it or not, whether it's politically correct or not, uh, whether it's a popular view, religious freedom gives me that space to speak. I mean, it's intricately connected with free speech. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately is the value of religious freedom. Yeah, that's very, I mean, thank you for that. That's very interesting. I, I mean, do you, do you see, I mean, I was, as, as you were speaking, it made me think, you know, there is a tendency within the, I don't want to only restrict this to the American Muslim community, but also I'll ask one last question, which is that, uh, you know, there is a tendency in which, um, you know, some members of the Muslim community will see people who, uh, let's say, voice some of the opinions that you just did, or maybe, you know, uh, uh, other similar ones, and, and there's a kind of a reflexive idea that, well, what you're doing is you're bandwagoning with let's say conservatives or something like that. But then conversely, we have to be honest, there's also pretty frequent accusations that let's say, you know, certain political activists, even let's say members of Congress like Ilhan Omar and others like this are, are similarly bandwagoning with the left, right? And there's this kind of um, idea that somehow uh, there's these um, either secret or open alliances and kind of political movements that are taking place. And it seems, and it seems that there's, uh, there's probably some truth to that. There's probably at one level that that actually is happening, where Muslims have divided up left and right. Um, uh, but there's probably also a degree to which it's just abusive, uh, and people are kind of making bad faith accusations against people for having bad intentions and sort of really being secret conservatives or ultra conservatives or secret uh, LGBT activists or something of the kind. You know, these really hot button issues in the American Muslim community. But. Um, I wonder. I mean, are we are we also are we being just as uh, naive about alignments as the broader society is? Because it seems to me that, like these days, I think what what the last election showed, the last presidential election showed, and I think you discussed this in your second book as well when talking about like these traits that are often associated with people, like what we consider to be left and right what we consider to be liberal and conservative and the traits that are supposed to go along with them and the groups who are supposed to be loyal to each side, it doesn't seem to work out, right? There seems to be either we've gotten it wrong up until now or there's a kind of a, a dynamic moment now where people are starting to realign and kind of, you know, and sort of get together in different kinds of coalitions. Trump increased his voting share amongst groups which people would not have expected that he would have increased his voting share with, you know, with, with, with minority communities and so forth. And I think one of the, I think coming up the next five, ten years, maybe the next generation, is perhaps we all need to rethink this kind of lazy even division between liberal, conservative, between left and right, 
and kind of become, and I, th I think this is something that you've really been pushing for, become a little bit more sophisticated about what it means to, let's say, group together with a certain group for a certain cause, you know, for certain kinds of outcomes. And I was wondering if maybe you could reflect on that. Like, what, what do you see coming? Uh, like, what are some of these uh, intellectual, perhaps, alliances that might be coming up, legal alliances, social, political? Um, because because you're, you're talking about, in, this, in the new book, the vulnerability and how there's a particular group, you know, white Christians, who feel things are being taken away from them, they feel the country is changing and so forth, which it, at a certain level is true. It, it is changing. There are certain things which are in fact being taken away and kind of and changing. And, you know, we don't want to just say, okay, well, Muslims and Christians should get together because we all have the same interests, something that's simple-minded. But there, but there are perhaps realignments and changes that we should be undertaking. Uh, that that are that are important to undertake, not just out of expediency, not just because oh we'll get what we want, but out of principle. You know there are certain principles that we can support, certain causes that are worth getting behind, and and I was pr perhaps you can reflect on some of those issues. Sure. So I agree with you that there is a tendency to kind of look at this type of work and say, well, this is equivalent of selling out or compromising with people who are. Uh, sort of beyond the pale, right? Just uh, people who are, I mean, so much of our conversation today tends to toward moralization, right? Instead of saying X, Y, Z person that we disagree with is wrong, suddenly they're evil and therefore it cannot be engaged with. And so, I mean, these are questions. I think there was an official book review that was put out where, where the reviewer actually had this one line where he, he said, this is a sociological analysis completely on point, but I wonder to what extent this takes into account the sort of dynamics of privilege and oppression, for example, which is something that yeah. I uh, addressed earlier on where, I'm, where I said, well, I was fully cognizant of questions of privilege and oppression. No, nowhere in the book did I equate the types of harm that different groups are facing. Um, I absolutely think that what American Muslims are facing is of, of, of a high, you know, higher degree of urgency than what Christians are facing. But uh, I think the more that we kind of devolve into the sort of competing victimhood, the less likely we are to move forward. And so I have an entire chapter dedicated to this phenomenon of competing victimhood, what mm -hmm. people in the, the human rights space call the victim Olympics. And so mm -hmm. it's better to stop competing and move on. But I think the other part of it is also what I said about, well, Competing, a competing victimhood at its core has different ideas of who exactly is privileged and who is oppressed. And so I would say that, yes, even though the tendency today is toward a discourse of confrontation um, and I take a very different approach, nothing here is about compromising something that is core to who we are. It's really about f figuring out what are paths of effective change um, and what are ways that we can do it with recognizing this sort of common humanity we have with other Americans. And that is something that I'm absolutely inspired by our faith toward. I, I think a lot of people use Islam to sort of justify their various sort of activist leanings. And, and in my world, I, I don't think that deciding that you know, half of the American population is evil and beyond the pale is at all reflective of what our faith demands for us in times like this and at any time. Um, so that, there's that. There's a tendency to sort of push back. And I, and I went into it knowing that there was, this was going to be a bit of an uphill battle. Um, and then this question of is this simplistic? Is, uh, you know, is this just another way of saying we should work with conservatives against, for example, LGBTQ rights? I mean, that's something I've absolutely seen other people engage in, that type of coalition building based on sort of shared notion around traditional sexuality and also sh shared fears around changing sexual norms. And this book is, is not about that. I mean, to for that sort of organizing to happen, you don't need a book like this, right? People have already seen what they have in common and they and they're making those co they're forming those coalitions. This book is really about complicating the very idea of our tribal alignments and calling for, as you noted, towards the end of my book, where I, I try to figure out some solutions or propose some solutions, I do talk a bit about cross-cutting coalitions. And it's really about being able to step aside from our automatic tendencies to group ourselves with a particular political agenda based on this broader tribal dynamic that has emerged. That to say that if we're going to be part of Team Blue, then we have to accept everything that Team Blue says. And similarly, if you're part of Team Red, you don't need to accept everything that's part of Team Red. There's There are elements of truth on both sides and there's elements that are really problematic on both sides. And I think mm -hmm. it's really about disentangling ourselves from that tribal divide and being able to think more critically 
Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is mindfulness. It, I set out in this book to, to explain the mechanics of polarization broadly, but more specifically the mechanics of polarization as they concern American Muslims and their relationship to Christians. And I'm like, once you become aware of the mechanics, it's a mindfulness that it has generated. Then you can begin to figure out how much of this am I going to fall for? How much of this am I going to accept? It doesn't mean I don't get to be angry about different things. Uh, I, can, I can be emotional. I can be passionate. But I'm going to be a little bit more mindful about the issues that I'm going to be mindful, uh, that I'm going to be passionate about. Right. Yeah. Um, do you find in the spaces that you work in that uh, you're fighting against? Because it seems to me that you are a at least as, as a legal thinker, as, a, as an author around these issues, that you are, you're very much in the kind of liberal civil rights tradition, uh, uh, it, it kind of the, what, you, what used to be considered kind of the mainline liberal tradition of America, focused around rights and focused around law and procedures and fairness and so forth and so on. But as you know, there, there is intellectually speaking in academia and the law schools and, and kind of legal theory, there's a pushback on the idea and that there are these there are systemic problems which cannot be solved merely through, you know, having fair laws and through the courts, but that there's kind of systemic racism, systemic bigotry, systemic uh, sexism and, and so forth and so on. And do you find do you find yourself in these spaces when you're arguing cases, when you're trying to build coalitions, when you're trying to talk to Muslims, when you're trying to talk to other people on these issues, that you're, you're running into a kind of a headwind where not only are you dealing with the particulars of the cases that you're dealing with, but you're also philosophically having to uh, sort of try to convince people that this approach that you take, this broad approach that you take, is the right way and that we, we, sh that we should not be um, as you say, kind of uh, factionalizing and adopting these mega identities, and you know, seeing ourselves in terms of power hierarchies. Because I think what you were what you were getting at is, like, look, today, today, uh, you, I mean, you never know if you, you might be the strong group today, but tomorrow you might not be. Like, you you might change your spot in the power hierarchy. So if it's if it's only a question of 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 helping oppressed groups. Are you helping those groups because they're oppressed, or are you identifying them by tribe? And if those tribes become strong, and the other tribe becomes weak, then what do you do? You've abandoned your principles, mm -hmm. and now you're sort of left with this kind of vulgar tribalism, which is the basis of your kind of uh, judgments of fairness, which uh, doesn't really leave room for people to have any kind of discussions with each other. So, but I'm, now I'm kind of getting off a topic of the question, which is that do, do you find yourself uh, tangling philosophically with people in the legal world and with the with the, some of the places that you work on those questions yeah i think you're exactly right with some of the things you're reflecting on so on this question of power i mean this is part of what i was talking about earlier this idea that somehow civil rights are only for those who are deemed powerless um, and they are not for those who we decided have power right so it's like civil rights are really there about realigning or and redistributing power right so again this idea of if muslims are part of this list of marginalized minorities those those people who made that list get to have civil rights and human rights but those who are powerful majorities we can oppose their rights we don't have to think twice about opposing what they bring uh to court because somehow they're outside the purview of what civil rights was meant to protect and i find that to be problematic uh, partly because, again, I do have an international lens, so I see how this sort of selective mm -hmm. approach to human rights and where it takes us, and it's it's not a good place. Um, and I think the other thing you were saying was something that I reflect on as well, this idea, this sort of obsession with power. Well, what happens when these range of uh, you know, minorities that are deemed marginalized right now and powerless right now do attain power, right? So. If, if we already see trends in that direction in terms of the sort of browning of America, right? So whites are going to become a smaller and smaller minority. Uh, the increasing sort of power in um, politics and what the, many people on the right, if you talk to them, they will stay in their perception, minorities have power, that they're the ones who have the real power, right? They are part and parcel of, again, quote unquote, the liberal elite. And it's an interesting sort of phenomenon to, to watch and to listen to the, these voices where they're expressing true vulnerability. And in the book, I actually quote an email that I got from one person, and he actually uses the word vulnerability to describe how he feels in this country. And again, these are the sorts of things that are scoffed, but 
a better scoffed at. But I think that if you just reflect on what he's saying, so in the courts, yes, the, the conservatives continue to win major wins at the Supreme Court. Um, but in the culture, I think it's unquestionable that liberals are winning. Um, and as he says, look, you know, you can turn on late night talk shows at any day and hear them making fun of conservatives. Um, you know, it's yeah. just day in, day out. That is very sort of accepted part of our popular culture. And again, people can listen to what I'm saying and say, yeah, they deserve to be laughed at. You know, what's mm -hmm. the problem? Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you're laughing at people and they're, and they're feeling deeply vulnerable. And then as I talk about in the book, that kind of uh, triggers this sort of process of uh, intergroup bias and hostility toward the people that they think are threatening them. Um, and so even right. this question right. of power hierarchies, I think it's really a question of perspective. And I'm not trying to make everything subjective. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a fact that, yes, in the legal space, conservatives are winning in the cultural space and, and the political space sort of goes back and forth. Uh, but the cultural space, I think it's unquestionable that the people with power are people on the political left. And so I think even that, like you need to shift your conversation around prior, prior hierarchies and who's more powerful, depending on which context you're looking at. Right. Um, and I think for me, in terms of you said, do I sort of find myself kind of confronting this resistance? And I think, yes, but I, I position myself in this space as somebody who, again, is a is, is a woman who is a racial, min a racial minority and I'm a religious minority, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm all kinds of minority. Mm -hmm. And then you have me sort of showing up in defense of white Christian conservatives. And it's a really sort of stark disruption of our tribal identities, right? Like people are just so used to saying, and I talk about this in the start of one of my chapters, in the second book where I talk about how I did this interview with Al Jazeera America, where I try to explain why the the win in the Hobby Lobby case was was a good thing. And it's like, oh my gosh, this international, you know, Qatari owned t television station. There's a Muslim female, like a non-white Muslim female mm -hmm. on there talking about this. It's like, this is not the sorts of things. This isn't the way we divide things. This is, right, the, there's right. a bunch of traits that, uh, that belong in the liberal mega identity. And now we've just sort of messed it all up. And I, and I, I take a lot of, joy and satisfaction and, and sort of confusing people in that way. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when I when I go and I've done a number of uh, speaking engagements, I what I try to do, I have this one presentation where I essentially take people through a series of cases there. They would never have imagined have anything in, in relation to each other, in common with each other. So right. cases challenging, for example, the anti-Sharia law in Oklahoma, uh, connecting that to a case with a Christian baker who declined to make a custom wedding cake for a gay couple, to uh, mm -hmm. the challenge against the statue of Jesus on federally owned property. Um, you know, just connecting to taking the person through these various different scenarios and explaining to them, as I'm taking them through, look at this principle. Oh, look at the way that this principle got applied in this case. And and it, and it takes people, based on what they've told me, on a, on a bit of an emotional roller coaster where they're just like, it's completely, again, messing up the way they divided things in their head. And mm -hmm. most recently, I did this with uh, the Supreme Court case in that was decided um, the, more, the, the evening before Thanksgiving um, that uh, struck down Governor Cuomo's restrictions, COVID regulations on houses of worship, Mm -hmm. And uh, well, and required him to be more fine tuned in the way that he was applying those regulations. Right. And the language in that Supreme Court opinion was about look, the the, the First Amendment or constitutional rights don't go on sabbatical. Like we're seven you know months into this pandemic, and I think we it's time to be a little bit more careful in terms of how we're restricting people's fundamental rights. And the overall theme here is how does a government need to react in relation to its protection of its citizens' rights in states of emergency? Mm -hmm. And a lots of Muslims on my social media were immediately opposed to the decision um, until I kind of pointed out to them in one speaking engagement that I did, well, guess which other religious group would love to have their rights protected uh, in types of states of emergency? Which is the group that typically gets hit? Which is the group that has gotten hit? And I remind them of, for example, NYPD surveillance that was just absolutely right. widespread and egregious in the, the aftermath of 9-11 for, for over a decade. And I'm like, you know, this types of stuff, it creates precedent. It creates precedent. And that is precedent that we can benefit from. Right. See, absolutely. I think that's the that's one of the key points is that there has to be a certain degree of of a long view 
right? One cannot just simply look at these immediate wins, like in the media or kind of public public opinion or so forth and so on. I mean, I think if anything that the conservatives have taught us is that you can just keep hammering at something that's pretty unpopular, and wind up getting long term gains. You know, so it's not they all those two things don't always track with each other. But um, you know, in the time that we have left, which is not a lot, you know, we've, we've I'm, I've been really provincial here and talking a lot about the American case. Uh, but perhaps you could reflect upon maybe, are the issues the same? Are there similar issues internationally? You know, for example, like, are, what are the differences, for example, between the way that Muslims in America have to deal with the law? And broadly speaking in Europe, let's say where you, you have Europe, uh, European Muslims, and we kind of conflate those two together, for example, it's, that's pretty common, you know, that they somehow face the same challenges. Mm -hmm. But actually, it, it, it's probably not the case when you, when you look at some of the details. And then also, if, you have, if, if you're inclined to maybe reflect on um, if those issues also apply in Muslim-majority uh, states, where you know the issues of minorities and religious rights also arise, so perhaps we can connect this conversation with with some of the uh, you know places outside of America, which which I, I, which I, some some of my colleagues outside of America will often say is kind of weird when it comes to some of these issues, these issues. You know, some of the conversations we're having, we're assuming that everyone is having, but they really aren't in all cases. Sometimes mm -hmm. we think we 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 we're kind of an oddball on some of these issues. Yeah, well, oddball, I think, in the sense that I think our, our issues are more complicated, right? They're more yeah. complex because I, I, we do have First Amendment protections. We do have protections under Religious Land Use Acts and Religious Freedom Restoration Acts that people in places like France and another, another, uh, a number of other European states that feel comfortable imposing things like burqa bans don't have. And the frame mm -hmm. in places like France is one of freedom from religion as mm -hmm. opposed to the U.S. framework of freedom for religion. And so in that sense, there is an absolute sort of stark difference. I think there's a difference in the type of Muslim also the, and the way the Muslims are perceived in these respective uh, sort of parts of the world. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there are lots of things that European Muslims are dealing with in terms of sort of that would be considered basic rights that for the most part, Americans will you know, see as, as obviously wrong, whether it be the ability to ha you know, wear the religious garb of your choice whether it be the intrusion of the government into uh, Islamic school curricula, uh, whether it be European governments choosing who's going to give the sermon or reviewing the sermon mm -hmm. in, you know, prior to it being delivered. I mean, those sorts of things are stark uh, violations right. of religious autonomy. And this actually reminds me of the question you asked about, well, what exactly is at stake with the free exercise clause? And th I think that's a perfect example, it's a per perfect illustration of everything you lose if you begin to water down your protections under the free exercise clause. So I think if anything, that should be a, sort of an alarming real world example of like, don't, don't give up what you have here because you might end up in that, in that scenario. Uh, and absolutely with a global sort of perception and, and sort of pervasive hostility against Muslims, I don't think it's, 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 beyond, it's beyond imagination. In fact, there are people in this country, people that the Center for American Progress has referred to as uh, being part of the fear, fear incorporated, mm -hmm. who actually say exactly these sorts of things. I mean, you have people like Pamela Geller, who says that a Muslim woman, uh, her wish to wear a headscarf in a workplace should not be accommodated because the hijab is a symbol of political domination. Um, and you know, a Muslim truck driver who doesn't want to transport alcohol because it's a violation of his religious beliefs and being complicit in the, the drinking of alcohol by others, uh, you know, is really just a symbol of Islamic domination. And so, and these people during the Trump era were were quite close to to the White House in terms mm -hmm. of influence. And so, it's not beyond the you know our imagination to think that these things can happen in the United States as well, uh, which is another reason why we need to protect our rights to free exercise. Uh, if, you know, with a lot of passion and, and, and clarity and, and strategy. Um, and then, but I think in terms of the, the, so those are the differences. I think some of the similarities are the culture war issues that, um, that European Muslims are also facing. Um, I think, for example, there was uh, lots going on in France right now in terms of claims of Islamo-leftism and how that's being cultivated on university right. campuses. Uh, that being considered sort of a import from uh, from the U.S. and American, the American Academy, uh, sort of conflation with that and critical race theory and so on, uh, to the point where you saw Macron's uh, government and his one of his, some of his top uh, government officials actually supporting that type of language. 
Um, and of course, when I saw this complaint about Islamo leftism, I couldn't help but think about my my theory of Muslims as parts of the liberal mega identity, uh, the sort of conflation of of Muslims and Islam with with the left. Um, so I think there's similarities there. I think on the culture war front, in terms of uh, sexual freedom and uh, the conflict between that and traditional religious mores, I think a lot of that is happening in Europe as well. I think they're they're much further down the road of secularism. Um, than the U.S. is, but I mm-hmm, think that there's definitely mm-hmm. similarities there in terms of shared in- shared concerns. Right. Yeah, I can't help but also reflect when you you brought up this uh, Islamo leftism idea and then tying it together with the mega identity concept that you use. Um, it also makes me wonder about the future of that mega identity because something that I always think about is what happens to this uh, this uh, to the American Muslim. Uh, component of this so-called mega identity, this kind of coalition, as people can sometimes conceive of it. What happens when, uh, for example, Ilhan Omar no longer functions very well as a thumb in the eye of conservatives? In other words, what happens if there's a new political situation in which liberals, uh, where Muslims are no longer very effective at irritating conservatives, right? Where, where let's say that we're in a new situation where the idea of symbolically trotting out Muslims, for example, like on that Hope poster, uh, or as kind of a, a sort of a, um, you know, a kind of a visual reminder to uh, of, of the nature of this kind of diverse coalition. Um, it seems to me that Muslims don't really steer the ship of that coalition in any real form anyway. So in other words, we're kind of in a precarious situation where the moment that Muslims cease to be useful as a kind of uh, ballast on the ship, you might say, that they'll just be left off. They'll just be, kind of be thrown out. People won't pay attention to them anymore. Do you see that as being a danger? I mean, am I overblowing it? Or it, To me, it seems as though there's no real leverage, politically speaking, socially speaking, in terms of clout that Muslims have. Um, they kind of serve at the behest of the groups who are really in charge of, you might say, that mega identity, if I can put it in such crass terms. Is that a real concern? Yeah, so the word that I use in my book to describe what's going on is that I say that that Muslims are essentially proxies for a larger set of, a totally separate larger set of issues, right? So Mm -hmm. in these tribal dynamics, the reaction to Muslims is is less about Muslims, in some cases not about Muslims at all, but about Muslims as a symbol for something that conservatives oppose about liberals. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that, you know, when I was thinking through this book and I was talking to this round table of engagement experts, this one professor was like, well, which Muslims are you talking about? And she herself is an African-American Muslim because she said like, her experiences are, are drastically different. And I'm like, well, in the book I said, I, it doesn't really matter because when the Muslims, in, in terms of these particular dynamics, Muslim period, regardless of which type of Muslim you are, is not this sort of imagination as sort of a trait of the, of the liberal team. Um, that those reactions are based on that. Nobody's sitting there sort of parsing, is this a white Muslim or, or a black Muslim or or an immigrant Muslim, um, a rich one or a poor one. It's really just that concept of Muslimness and, and, and Islam uh, and the way that it sort of serves as, as a symbol, as this uh, token or a proxy. Um, in contrast, of course, in the book, I do distinguish which Christians I'm talking about because I think that that needs to be parsed for various reasons mm-hmm. that I explain in the book. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you are a proxy for much bigger issues and when you cease to serve that function, when you're no longer the best the best uh, tool to sort of achieve those ends. And I think absolutely you risk becoming irrelevant. Um, and a part of this, a part of the, I mean, this is a, largely the reason why I encourage Muslims to always focus on what's authentic to, to them, as opposed to doing simply what, uh, yes. what this larger coalition requires of them. Uh, don't give up your authenticity in that process. Um, because in the end, I mean, all you really have is whether or not you were true to yourself and to your faith. This, this, I think, is the theme that I, I, I hear in, your, in what you're saying, and I also want to commend you on it, which is that um, th- th- we can't always be, Muslims, I should say, Muslims cannot always be jumping on bandwagons, right? There has to be leading in terms of principle. And I suspect, and I can't say this for sure, but I suspect that there's probably a lot of Christians and Jews and others who, when they see you doing the work that you're doing, are probably themselves glad for their own sake, right, that they're seeing a kind of 
somebody who's doing something based upon this principle, which is probably embattled, not just probably, which is certainly embattled in their own community, right? So, I mean, in, in the American culture war, I think, culture wars, I think Muslims, uh, whether it's uh, these principles of fairness, ethical principles, uh, whether it's the way in which we um, see ourselves in society as neighbors and so forth and so on, I'm, I'm really, I think the way forward is for us to stop being transactional, to stop being overly strategic and tactical, and to because you're not going to be able to sustain that for very long. You enter into some kind of arrangement with a coalition or something just out of pure self-interest, it'll probably fizzle out. It's not going to have any real energy. It's not going to have any, as you said, authenticity. And as Muslims would say, it's not going to have any barakah. It's not going to have any kind of real uh, quality to it. But if we are faithful to ourselves, if we're, if we're authentic to our own intentions, not only will we feel the benefit of that, which is just integrity, your own personal integrity, but I think I, sometimes we're so pessimistic, we feel so, you know, we look at our own histories and we think that this is not even possible. But other people will follow, you know, other people will, they'll, I think there's a certain degree of inspiration that other people can take if, if uh, Muslims do this, even if it's not quite popular, or if it doesn't kind of uh, gain immediate um, action, uh, I should say an immediate reaction or an immediate response. And so, you know, any lawyers who are listening, uh, anybody who's in kind of in the legal field, I would say that they should definitely read your books. They should consider kind of following in your footsteps um, in some of these areas that you're working in. Because it strikes me that it's not as though you, there's a lot of, uh, it's not as though there are many of you, who, you know, who are dealing with this particular area. Unless I'm wrong, it just seems, that's my impression. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a loner in the space, but I'm hoping that with my writing and engagement, I can I can sort of clone myself. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'm, you're, when I was outlining the book, um, one of my friends he had this comment. I, I sent it to him for for some comments, and he said, you know, what'd be interesting in, in what you're essentially doing in this book is saying because remember the question of power and who's in power is is really dependent on your your perspective. And so from the perspective of a lot of conservative white Christians, they see, again, this range of minorities that are championed, that are getting lots of opportunities, that are being featured in various sort of major uh, media and entertainment spaces by liberals. Uh, they're getting all kinds of you know, openings and opportunities. And they see Muslims as one of those people, as a one part of a group of such people. And so in their perspective, there is an element of power that is being ascribed to Muslims. And I think that's important here in understanding how these power dynamics are are interpreted and experienced. And so he said, in that framing, whether you and I might disagree that we're, I mean, I don't feel powerful. Um, I don't feel like the Muslim community. We, we have all these internal sort of intra-religious critiques about what our community is doing and how it's going it's setting itself up for, for problems down the road and so on. Um, but in that perception, that's power, right? And so he's mm -hmm. like, what you're modeling is that, look, now that I'm in a position of power, you know, before you were in a position of power, this is what you did to me. But let me tell you now that I'm in a position of power, I choose to to use that power in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's it's about um, you know it's showing this isn't about sort of stepping on your rights or stepping on you or ignoring you or scoffing at you or making fun of your feelings of vulnerability and anxiety. I'm taking you seriously, and this is a model that you know I, I hope that you will continue to emulate, regardless of whether you regain that power in the future. I mean, I remember I did this event with Imam Majid. Um, from the, the D, this D.C. area, um, mm -hmm. from the Adams Mosque, and he said something. He said, there's nothing inherently wrong or bad about privilege. It's a question about how you're using privilege. And so I think that kind of gets at this. So whatever your perception of who has privilege, it's about how you choose to use that. And so I think that get, gets at what you were talking about as well. And, and in the book, I talk about it through the frames of either covenantal pluralism or confident pluralism, uh, a space where, yes, even though a lot of this is premised on this, what you can think of as transactional, right? Self-interest. Hey, conservative white Christians, if you really care about religious freedom and are worried about the threats to religious freedom, w one really important thing you have to keep in mind if you don't want it to actually be diluted is to protect the rights of Muslims, right? That's ultimately a transactional element. In which, by the way, I have to be very careful that my work also is not tokenized or instrumentalized for simply serving those interests, right? Like, right, I, I don't want yeah. it to be that, oh, well, she's making it politically palatable or, she, you know, and, and it's ultimately leading to the thing that we want. Um, mm -hmm. We have to move beyond the transaction. I think it might be a starting point, 
But ultimately, we have to make this about people, about that covenantal piece of it, and about how much of this is about our respective fates calling us to do something higher than than what this tribal society uh, is sort of limits us to. I mean, these are such important things to reflect on. Um, Asma, thank you so much. Uh, it was really great having this conversation with you. Um, and uh, I hope that the Renovatio podcast can have you back again to speak about some of these and related issues soon. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Sam.